Welcome to ESPN Esports. My name is Jacob Wolf, and I am joined today by Emily Rand and Tyler Erzberger. Earlier today, it was reported by Travis Gafford that Doublelift is being traded potentially, that he is on the trade block by Team Liquid. This has been confirmed by Tyler and I, which is why we are making this video. We wanted to give our reactions to the news, talk about possible landing destinations and the offseason at large, given the coronavirus pandemic and how that may be affecting things in leagues around the world, including the LCS. So first of all, Tyler and Emily, how are you? I'm pretty surprised. Uh, uh, yeah. I am mildly surprised. Uh, it felt like Team Liquid was supposed to be the home of Double It felt like finally after CLG and TSM, this was kind of going to be his, like, I could have seen Double It retire on Team Liquid. He could have been that player, like a faker, a ruler, or perks, where he slides into management after his tenure, but it looks like that's not going to be the case. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit. You know, there seems to be a resounding theory like here's the guy that has four championships and then he ends up uh, even going what to MSI and performing incredibly well. And and then one bad split and it's all over. Do you think that this is sort of like a, you know, knee jerk reaction from Team Liquid after not finding a ton of success in this 2020 spring split? Or how do you guys feel about the decision overall now that he's on the trade block? I think it might have more to do. It's it is kind of a, a bit of a knee jerk situation. I think this team Liquid roster just generally didn't have a lot of time to gel together because Broxa didn't even get here until more than halfway through the split, right? So um, that was an issue for the team. And then additionally, like Double Lift himself admitted that he had motivation issues around the spring split because it doesn't count towards championship points. Um, I can see that not necessarily going over well with either TL or other teammates. I don't, again, I don't know if this is the case. It's just that typically when this kind of situation happens in any sort of work environment, it affects that work environment very negatively. Um, so it, it's like kind of a knee-jerk reaction, but at the same time, I think it's less of a, we, we ended in ninth place and now double lift is getting kicked. But and and if he does get traded, it would be more of a, um, you know, like this caused internal issues on our team that we don't want to deal with going into the summer split. I think it'd be more of that, if that makes sense. I, I think it's a lot stemming from Worlds, actually. I think this started all the way back at in Europe at Worlds, where Team Liquid were expected to make a run in the bracket stage. They were... They were doing well in scrims. They 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 were prepared. They felt like they had the best NA team ever. They went to the finals at MS, MSI and it, and they won their first game versus Damwon. And they looked amazing. They looked like a team that could actually contend for a title after their first game at Worlds. And then it all fell apart. They don't make it out of groups again. The stigma stays there of double lift. They Smithy goes to Immortals. They bring in Broxa. It's a team that is always looking for the stars, right? They're looking for championships. Without the amount of money they've put into this team, from Impact to Double Lift to getting Broxa, they've spent so much money to put this team together that it's not even losing Spring Split. It's more of that they need to contend at the World Championship to make any of this matter for them. And then when you have a demotivated Double Lift and you have Broxa coming in, who knows how he's dealing with the team? I mean, you're throwing him into the worst situation possible during a global pandemic where the team isn't doing well and he's far away from home. You have a bunch of personalities who are very, uh, uh, very, very big personalities on this team who all believe that they're a top player in the league. And it just didn't, it doesn't seem like it just, you know, imploded for them where a ninth place finished. There's a global pandemic going on, which you can't overlook, right? It's something we're going to get into more as we talk about possible landing places for double lift is that right now everything is topsy turvy. Nothing. Everyone's stressed out. Everyone's thinking about money. Everyone's thinking about their job security. Everyone's thinking about everything like that. So it, it's a lot of factors getting thrown into this and it just brings this, this result where, a four-time back-to-back-to-back-to-back champion is most likely not going to be on his the team that he's kind of raised up into this, you know, pantheon uh, next season. But who knows where he's going to go. I want to talk a little bit about the cost situation. I think we all have sort of uh, insight. But first, I wanted to circle back to something Tyler said earlier about 
you know, we thought the double lift could finish his career here. We saw the Bjergsen rule, as we uh, aptly call it, right, where the LCS players are now allowed to have team ownership if they've been there more than three year, three consecutive years. Double lift was one of the next people in line to do that realistically, right? He's been on Team Liquid for a while now. Um, you know, did you think that that was like, did you all feel as, as similar to I did, the fact that like he could be the next person in line for that and the fact that he could be an owner of Team Liquid one day? Yeah, is that, is I mean, that, is that I, mean I thought I thought it was like a possibility. I also think that Double Lift historically, whether it's like on him or on the team, seems to have these like breakups that that happen. Uh, and in this case, I think TL like, again, if they do decide to trade him, it's it's going to be due to the motivation issues that he himself admitted to. Um, but it it's also like. It was weird for me to think of Double Lift sticking with any one team, despite the fact that he was next in line, because there have been so many times where historically either like a, a team has kicked him, like CLG, which was really unexpected, and then the the splitting with TSM, which I think was really unexpected for him personally. Um, mm -hmm. So, and and I don't know, like. It's really difficult for me to think that Double Lift wouldn't have had a hand in being traded. Like, if if TL came to him and they're like, "Okay, we're trading you," I would think at the very least, and I know Travis also talked about this in his video, but I would think at the very least they would give him a lot of sway in terms of where he could go. It wouldn't just be like Steve going to him and being like, "Hey, we're trading you to CLG." Uh, who I picked not for the memes because it was Double Lift's first team, but because they were the last place team this past split. Um, so, but but again, like just due to history, it was a little bit difficult for me to see Double Lift stepping into any sort of team ownership role. And I don't know if that's because I just can't imagine him like not playing. Like, you know, he's tried the streaming thing and he said, no, like I want to play. And he even came back for Team Liquid to play during that time. So it's always been really difficult for me to to think of him in any sort of ownership position, even while he's still playing, despite the fact that that's obviously possible. We're seeing it from Bjergsen right now. Um, that like the idea of double lift as an owner was always a bit weird to me in terms of what I think of him as a competitor. I, I think I saw the, the, the path to him becoming an owner. Like I saw him being kind of maybe even groomed to being the, you know, the perks, the faker, the ruler, that kind of, you know, franchise player. But I think this kind of just signifies that Double O's career is going to go down as him being the greatest vagabond mercenary player of all time. He's when players usually retire, they get their jersey retired or they they have that one team that they kind of have on their chest where it's like, you know, Michael Jordan plays for the Wizards, but he's always a bull. It's the same thing with LeBron. LeBron's going to retire, but he'll always be remembered as a Cav. For Double Lift, who who knows now? Like when he retires, I mean, he's had his career so he had so many great moments on CLG, getting them their first title. TSM obviously was probably the peak of his career in terms of popularity and just the the, the amount of dominance he had on that team. And then he won four titles straight with Team Liquid. Like if you retired today, I don't know which team you would go down as being that kind of player. So I think his legacy at the end of the day is he's he's the best player, the best North American born League of Legends player of all time. But he doesn't belong to one team. It seems like he just goes from team to team to team kind of as a mercenary vagabond. And I think that's going to be his legacy when he finally retires is that he kind of just went from town to town winning championships and never really calling a place home, which is, I mean, it's an awesome like you know legacy to leave it behind, but it's kind of sad. It's, it's kind of sad that, you know, when Bjergsen retires, he goes to TSM, he has that legacy forever. He's TSM. Faker, when he retires, SKT, T1, he has that legacy Double lift. When he retires, he looks back, and you know he'll have those championships. But there's gonna be a lot of towns burned to the ground, you know, through all of the, you know, drama and the, the removals and the trades and everything like that. So it's a really, really interesting legacy that you don't really see much in sports. You know, you both just alluded to those breakups, and we've seen them in the past, right? We saw with the CLG situation, he wins a championship and domestically and goes to Worlds that year with CLG, and then on Halloween night, we see a video released where he has been kicked from CLG. He <laughs> is, is the video is him 
Uh, I linked it earlier in our Slack chat, but it's him laying in a pile of garbage with a CLG jersey on where Bjergsen presents him with a TSM jacket and shirt that he goes into a bathroom, takes a shower and throws a CLG jersey in a, in a trash can, right? Like that's, it's, it's sort of, his brand is more or less this drama, right? And we saw with TSM, him leaving TSM, also kicked from TSM. And, but he actually, if you remember, he said he found out from DK's reporting that Sven and Mithy were joining TSM. Uh, that that someone else had reported that he was being replaced, and and obviously I think that there was a little bit of bad blood there, it was particularly with Reginald, who at the time was sort of in charge of TSM as a whole. But we've seen recently uh, today, after Travis's reporting, that there's a lot of speculation around th that he could potentially go back to TSM. You know, I I want to say just like how this has been handled is really odd, right? So like Travis Gafford, for those unfamiliar, is double his best friend. Uh, and he's the reporter who's breaking this story uh, today on this. And, and he said in the video that he had not talked to Doublelift about this. I don't know if I necessarily believe that, but we'll take Travis at his word. Uh, and the other part of this is, is and again, I want to be careful treading these waters, but Doublelift's girlfriend is the president of TSM. And Reginald, the person who kicked him from TSM, is still the top executive, but he is the top executive of Swift, which is the company that owns TSM, not TSM itself. He's not involved in the day to day any longer. Um, Lena is. Uh, and so when you look at potential landing destinations for him and sort of what's there with TSM, you know, obviously if, if that's where he ends up, people are going to scream from the rooftops uh, that this is an incestuous move, right? Uh, that this is him going back to a team that's ran by his girlfriend um, and you can't get around that. And it's it definitely is this sort of unfortunate circumstance, right? Where like people automatically make the worst assumptions in dating life, both for men and women, um, and, and particularly in esports. Uh, we've seen it all for a very long time. But do you think that, do, if say he does go to TSM, is that do you, how do you think you work around that, in, in your opinion? Or do you think you cannot, you just have to embrace it? I mean, you kind of just have to, like, it is what it is. And if he did end up on TSM, like, it's not like people don't know about it, right? So... Um, like it, it would just be another, another thing that would happen in his trip over there. I think people would be initially forgiving of it if TSM does well, because I honestly think like, especially for an organization like TSM winning erases all like trespasses, yeah. right? Like it, it just like all of your sins are washed clean as long as you win. And so if he comes onto this team and is somehow able to, perform a lot better with them. Um, I, I like stylistically, my brain is saying that's not going to work out for a lot of like analytical reasons, but say that he did come on and he performed like super, super well on this team and they end up, you know, like just raising through the summer split. I think no one would care at all. Yeah. I, I now, agree with. Oh. Yeah. If he does poorly, that's a different story, but yeah, I agree with Emily, where it's a thing of there will be memes if, if Doublelift does return to TSM, but Reggie, Lena, Doublelift are all very good at their job. They're, I think even I think all of us can agree that all three of them have are really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. Like, Doublelift is a great player. Lena's great running the team. Uh, Reggie basically built an empire from, you know, a, a, a league, a, a forum post like 10 years ago, basically saying, I want to create a team. Let's create a team, and he built an empire. And now he's a near five hundred million dollar business. So yeah, well now done. yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Well done, all three. So the thing is, all three of them know what it takes to be successful at their jobs. So if all three of them connect up and say, "This is the best chance we have to go to worlds and to be successful," they will do it. And if they can do that, none of, none of the memes are going to last longer than a week. Because if they win, that's all that matters. The person I I feel worse about in the situation: Lena, Reggie, Double If. They're all going to be fine. They. They're all very good at their jobs. They've all, you know, done far, far and away, you know, the, the barometer of what it means to be successful in life. The person I feel worse about is Kabe because Kabe sits there and Kabe is sitting there kind of like double lift a few years ago when he got replaced by Sven and Mithy where there's the rumor because I was at Worlds a few years ago, right, you know, and there is the rumor at Worlds that Sven and Mithy were taking over double lift at the tournament. Like people already knew that that was happening weeks before it actually actually occurred. These things happen quickly in esports, where it's one day they lose, the next day there's already replacements being lined up. For Kabe, this is awful if this happens, because he's sitting there and he can't go home. It's the deal of no one has money right now. No one in, it's a, it's a situation where because of the global pandemic, 
traveling out of the country is difficult for one, and then getting transferring big contracts is also difficult. So let's say Doublelift does come over to TSM, and TSM's like, hey, we're gonna split time with you, but not really, we're gonna give Doublelift the keys, because we had to, you know, if, if, if TSM gets Doublelift, they're playing Doublelift, because it's gonna take a big money sink to have him come over with the big contract and current, you know, the, the, the current financial situation of all the teams. For Kabe, he's gonna have to sit there and be like, okay, none of the LEC teams are gonna pick me up because I have a big contract and you can't really go home. And there's, I don't, and he's an import too. So it's not, it's not an easy trade to another team. I think logically you'd be like, oh, we trade him to TL and then TL can have Kabe, but nope, they already have enough imports. Yeah. They can't. So like, it really sucks for Kabe if this happens because Kabe has to just sit there and just listen to these rumors and be like, I can't really go home. I'm kind of stuck. Um, he's a really good player. I mean, he got a really shorter than the stick of how TSA played last year. I mean, last split. I mean, they were playing mostly through mid and top where he was kind of had to be the sacrificial lamb a lot of times. So it's a, I feel worse for Kabe. Double if Lena, Reggie, they're going to be fine. If those three connect, I feel confident that they can produce victories. But for Kabe, it's just a really, really, really bad situation for him. So I think moving forward, this is a part of the discussion we should have, right? Is that this is my understanding of Double F's financial situation. This is a high six figure contract, sub $1 million, below $1 million, but very, we're pushing it, right? In the higher, you know, $800,000, $900,000 range, I believe, in that upper upper echelon of six figures. Um, that usually means that it has a pretty large buyout uh, that is associated with it to move it. Um, I don't know what type of guarantees exist in that in that deal um either which which would entitle tl to pay some of it out i would imagine if there are some um and right now we're sitting in a position where not just the travel part of it i think what people don't realize about the pandemic is that the econ the american economy is in the toilet because of because of the coronavirus right and what is what i've been hearing from various different teams across all of esports league of legends and otherwise including some of the lcs is that there's a resounding feeling that no one ha can raise money for the next year and a half and so any money that has been fundraised by in, in investment rounds for the past year, that you have to make do, right? A lot of these businesses, the way that they're structured, TSM, Liquid, C9, you know, they raise money every year to 18 months. They bring in, you know, 30, 40 million, and they spend it a lot in some instances, right? Especially with things when you're operating big teams in the Overwatch League and Counter-Strike and League of Legends, where these salaries are pretty enormous, uh, you know, pushing in some cases a million plus dollars, right? In impact in Huni, which we'll get to Huni in a second. Um, but we see, we see sort of this resounding theory that that you know you're they're going to have to make do with money that they plan to use for the next six to eight months, and then raise in the fall. They're going to have to make do for the next eighteen until the world sort of stabilizes uh, economically. So that said, I don't think we're going to see a lot of movement this off this mid season. We saw Excel say that they were going to make adjustments mid and top side. Um, we saw the, now we see the double thing. We see Huni on, on uh, looking for options as well. But there's a realistic outcome here where double lift and Huni just end up being streamers, right? Like mm -hmm. this, that's, that's likely, I would say more than anything, because who wants to buy those giant contracts, right? Yeah. I mean, so streaming is weird. Like, I'll put that aside because I think Doublelift has an odd, not an odd relationship with streaming, but since he's tried it, there's stuff to talk about there. Um, but I agree, and I brought this up when we talked about the Huni contract on our League of Legends show, Rift Rewind, and it's that even if Huni is out there, there are very few teams that are going to be willing to pick up that contract. So even if Doublelift is out there, that's actually why like TSM is maybe one of the only actual like legitimate options outside of the other things we already discussed is that maybe they would be willing to pick up whatever the the buyout is to, to get that trade. But um, I mean, no one is looking to make moves. Like talking to a lot of people, they were like, there's no time to do it. So even if you want to make changes, you can't, especially if like, say you wanted to swap out um, one of your players who's not from the United States, they'd have to undergo a mandatory 14 day quarantine before they could even and play, visas. as far as I know. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's putting aside the, like everything else we've already seen that 
visas are uh, increasingly difficult to get, um, as we saw from the entire Boxa situation where he was flagged for pretty much no reason. There's nothing wrong with his visa. It's not like TL hasn't applied for visas before. Um, and it's been like uh, every year since about, you know, late 2015, early 2016, it's been increasingly timely. Like it, it, there's been increasing amount of time it takes for teams to get visas just generally. Um, and I think like if you're if you're looking at other teams during this offseason who are also trying to save money, like who is going to pick up that contract, regardless of how good of a player double lift is and putting aside all of the other stuff? Like, why are you going to be spending that money, especially with how tenuous everything seems to be regarding competition like we still don't know what's going on with msi really like we know what riot has said previously but i feel like that's still completely in flux given what has already changed from that announcement to now we don't know i mean i presume they're still planning on holding the world championship in china but like we don't know how that's going to work logistically like we don't and know any epidemiologists of that say that there's a chance that it, the coronavirus could spike again in the fall oh. right and in, in yeah. china potentially right which would make things much more difficult yeah and i mean like it's already going to be difficult because it's still going to be going on here and in europe and and you know elsewhere so i think uh the big thing to me is that because the future is so uncertain it seems to me that the best option would be to go back to TL and not get traded, which is awkward in and of itself now that this news is out. Like if it if it hadn't gotten out and they'd just been doing all this somehow without people knowing, trying to trade the teams, which is like next to impossible, but say they'd been able to pull it off, it's not nearly as awkward as now you have all of this out in the open and then double if coming back to the team and being like, okay, well, I'm still here because no one was going to pick up my contract. And then the other option is streaming. And Doublelift has said previously, especially in a summer season, like this isn't spring season, like when he was on TSM and he's like, I need a break and I'm going to take this off because we went so hard in, in 2016 summer and, you know, we didn't make it and that was really frustrating and I'm just going to stream for a, for a split and then, and then come back. Like that happened and he ended up coming back on TL because A, I, I'm sure he got offered money to do it but then b he just wanted to compete right like and tsm was like yeah okay you're coming back in summer go help tl not get relegated um he's a competitor like above all else even when he's tried to step back and chill out and he could make a massive amount of money streaming let's be real uh he hasn't liked it he wants to go back he wants to compete and so that in and of itself makes the situation like particularly sticky for him because going back to TL presumably based on whatever internal issues they're having is going to be really awkward and potentially damaging to whatever that team could do in summer. But streaming is not a great option and there might not be willing uh, to be any team that would pick up his contract. Yeah. Everything right now is top I mean, we all, I think all three of us can say that we've all heard the same place location that's been proposed for MSI that was supposed to be MSI a few months ago. And they've already had to switch it a few times. I don't think MSI, as it was supposed to be planned, can even be played. I'll, I'll just I'll just say it because I have that on good authority. It was yeah. it was originally Turkey and then moved to Los Angeles. Yeah, and it was. Yeah. Los, Los Angeles is is a. I, I mean, look out my window. I'm in the other hotbed here in yep. the United States for coronavirus. New York and Los I Angeles. I haven't left my the, house in a month and a half. Yeah, it New was. York, yeah, yeah, New York, Los Angeles, and Washington State have very do well documented huge yep. issues with the coronavirus more than other places I in mean, the United States. We can kind of just say, like, the finals were, I mean, it was supposed to be in Turkey, and then they had to move it for mm -hmm. reasons not related to the coronavirus. And then it was proposed, I mean, we've all heard from multiple sources that it was supposed to be in L.A. for an all-L.A. MSI, which was going to be mm -hmm. awesome, because as, as someone who lives in L.A., it was yeah, going to be uh, fun. Yeah, we didn't have to travel. We were yeah, all prepared. Yeah, yeah. And, then the final, and then the final was proposed to be in the Forum, which is a former one of most, the Lakers mm -hmm. and former, former former home of the Lakers, one of the, yeah. one of the most legendary stadiums in the world. And recently purchased by the owner of the Clippers to be the new yeah. site of the, the new Los Angeles Clippers basketball stadium. And it was going to, and we were all excited because it was like, oh, yeah, we, it was a few months ago, it was the deal of, oh, can China get over to LA to play in the MSI? That was the big thing for us. It was like, oh, can China make it here? 
Like now uh, it's getting weak into China. To exactly. Go, right. Like, now it now it's flipped. Where it's oh, can even NA make it to China to go to World? It's a total flip of the situation because it was supposed to be. It was it was it was being planned to be at the forum and it was going to be an awesome event. But as the governor, I believe of L, uh, of California, said yesterday or the day before, or the mayor of LA said there's not going to be any live you know big gatherings of people for sporting events until 2021 so there's no that that so there is not going to be no msi at the forum there's no going to be no msi at la i don't know what msi could be or where it could be if it's not online but it's a it's a really sticky situation and i'm kind of disappointed because that would have been an awesome tournament of being at the forum being in la it wouldn't it wouldn't have been as the biggest spectacle of msi we've had in the past because they would have had to cut things down just because of the coronavirus but it just sucks. It's another thing of like, uh, it's another tournament that kind of has been swept away by this thing. And it, it goes back to the double of situation of everything's in flux and yeah. the in, in free agency importing, all of that is going to be on the downturn for the next probably year or so. And I think the only, weirdly enough, I think the only winner in the situation, if you look at it, is Cloud9 who have built an infrastructure where they keep, in where they keep, you know, they have Tyler Fox in the mid lane. If you're looking for an upgrade now, if you're an LCS team for mid lane, you can't look at Europe. You can't look at Korea because it's hard to import those yeah. players and they cost too it's much. Not even, it's not even safe to travel really yeah. from one team house to another, yeah. much much yeah. less from one country across the yeah. world to Los Angeles, right? Like. So if you're a team looking for an upgrade, you're saying, oh, Powell Fox, he's killing it in, in the academy. He's not going to cost a million dollars and we and he can actually travel. So, and then you have King, who's been also really, really good. C9's infrastructure of producing these unknown talents and kind of boosting them up is going to look really good when these teams have big money, you know, big, you know, uh, investor pockets who just are generally going to spend a million dollars on imports can't do that for the next year. So it's really going to show us who are the best teams coming up and who is crafty enough with their scouting to actually get the best players in-house and in the North American region to actually contend for a championship. Well, not that TL is like hurting for money because I don't think they are, but like that could be another reason where they're just like, hey, this isn't working out. Let's see if we can get money for this player on on the trade market. Like that's and another side of this we haven't discussed. I saw two other names come up recently and some of the people I talked to and I think relative there's only one of the two that's realistic and that would be evil geniuses and immortals and I think of the two immortals is the only other one that would be even remotely realistic but given the situation at hand right <laughs> evil geniuses has import slots taken up by bang and taken up by Jizuke it's not as easy as saying bang for double if because of what we said earlier with J Jensen, uh, Jensen and Broxa take up import slots on uh, Team Liquid, right? Impact is already in the clear uh, there in that regard. Um, or is it? No, I believe it's the inverse. Impact is not in the clear and Jensen is. It's one or the other. Uh, it's core. Co it's core. It's core and it's core. And oh, Broxa. yeah, right. You're right. Yeah. They're both in the clear. It's core and Broxa who are in the clear. My mistake. Um, so it's not as easy as bang for double lift and making core, that core swapping back to ABC. I just had uh, the I just had the, the big brain play in my mind. No, um, I'm kidding. That's not actually true. But if you're liquid and and you, you know, if the TSM thing is not where this eventually ends, and even if it does, you can't take Kabe either because he's a European import. So do you either look for somewhere in Academy or do you bet your chips on Tactical? I mean, Tactical played fine. Like, yeah. I, I, again, like, I don't think if you're betting uh, your stuff on Tactical... I think that Team Liquid's play style might change a bit. However, in terms of did did Liquid as a team look better or worse with Tactical, honestly, they looked about the same. Like, there wasn't really... Like, you can't pin any of those losses on, on Tactical. And similarly, unless there was some massive internal communication issue that we don't know about, um, I don't think you can pin a lot of those losses on Double Lift specifically either. Uh, even with the motivation issues, he said, like, you can't pin it on his individual performance, especially not after he came back. So uh, it's it's kind of like, okay, like tactical performed well. And I mean, I've been saying this since the offseason. I feel like any team should just give their own talent a chance regardless. 
maybe now the coronavirus pandemic will uh, force them to, which is not the circumstance that I would have wanted for anyone. But um, I mean, the, I thought Tactical was fine. I think he needs work, but I think he's fine. Tactical is a good player. I mean, I I think there's this somehow like notion that Cloud9 just kind of gets lucky or they just magically pick up these star like NA talents like, oh, Blabber, Licorice, Vulcan, they just turned out to be really good. No, it's like they they help these guys get better. Like Blabber, if you take Blabber and you throw him at Immortals or Dignitas and have those, like, you know, any team other than C9 really, and have those teams raise up Blabber, Blabber is nowhere near the MVP candidate he is today. It's having the right infrastructure around these players to give them the boost up to become those all-star world-class players that we've now seen guys like Vulcan and Blabber become. And it's really, I really, really hope, I mean, now that we can't just, you know, buy South Korean players for 1.5 million and give Hooney a ton of money. And I really hope these teams look at this, you know, pandemic, it's a terrible situation. No, and, and, and there's, there's not a lot of silver linings here, but hopefully that these teams realize that, They need to invest in infrastructure and building around these homegrown talents because just look at C9. Blabber, Vulcan, and Licorice are all, I would all say they are on the cusp of being world-class players. They can all, I would not be scared of them going to a world championship. I don't think they're going to get. Licorice is a world-class player. Like, yeah, yeah. And I think Blabber, I mean, Blabber last year when he wasn't even near as good as he's now was still going, he was beating Yankos and Tarzan in the early game. Now Tarzan not that big of an accomplishment now that Tarzan looks how he does on Griffin this year, but it's, it's really just kind of shining the light of tactical can be a world-class player. He has the talent. you you talk to people. They all think he's mechanically gifted. It's more of his raising him up correctly and not janking around the chain and kind of destroying his development. Blabber, when C9 had the decision of either keeping Son Scaring or Blabber, they trusted in Blabber in his development, and they felt it was the right time to boost him up from being a sub or half starter to being the full time starter. And it worked out for both sides. And now we could see an EG versus a C9 final. I mean, historically, TL has not been the team to do that. So nope. the, funny, th- very much the, like the, the funny thing about this is that because they're now being really forced to like evaluate their roster and it's not working out, like, what do they do now? Because the last thing I would want is for TL to just suddenly start rifling through NA players and then (laughs) discarding them, because we all know how the community will then suddenly view those players, and it puts it doesn't set them up for success either. So it, it is really interesting how this is really forcing TL to look at their roster building strategy and and look at why this specific team didn't work because I don't think we've even heard a lot of like what was going on internally with this team. I'm not saying it was like super bad, but obviously there's, they just like, were not clicking together um, and they didn't have a lot of time to come together. So and, it, it is really interesting. At, I just want to point out like how this team liquid team was built to your point, right? Like this team liquid team, team liquid was nearly relegated, right? At one point. And <laughs> And double team, they, they got double lift. Double, yeah, double lift was the was the savior. You know, he he uh, he kale ulted them through the uh, through the relegation tournament uh, to make them survive. Um, then they get franchised, and it seemed like that was the like snapping moment, right? Was at the end of 2017, you get the franchise slot, and it's like we are not going to be bad any longer. And so you see how this goes, right? You you first see that. They they get all the Immortals players. They pay a truckload of money for all the all the Immortals players under contract. It's Smithy, Poe Belter, Ale, right? Buy them all, buy them all. Uh, and then we see they they outbid C9 for Impact, right? Like who, where he had been previously was on Cloud Nine, and they pay him a bucket load of money. A year later, we see fast forward. Poe Belter kicked to the curve. Hey C9, we'll pay you a bucket load of money to to buy out Jensen, right? This is. This is the team that of all the teams in the LCS, they have bought their way to success. Now, I'm not diminishing those four trophies, right? They have the four trophies. Good on you. All of them won with double F2, just to be clear. However, it is definitely the team that the paid by Steve money gun shooting meme is not so much a meme. It is definitely the way that the League of Legends side of Team Liquid operates. Um, That said, 
you're right. There's not an easy fix. And like if, if he ended up at Immortals, he, Doublelift has said that he enjoys playing with Xmithy. And obviously Xmithy is a former Team Liquid guy and was a big part of their culture when they won last year versus, you know, this year without him. Uh, you know, did, I guess the option there, right, is do you want Apollo or Alltech? Does that make things any better, right? Like, that's not buying your way to success, but you don't really have many options here right now that are North American-born AD carries that are on the market. I mean, I don't think Paul, Apollo is a bad option at all, actually. But I mean, I would still take again, Tactical over Apollo. I mean, it just it would be silly to take Apollo over Tactical. I mean, I don't I don't think Apollo is that much better than Tactical as is, and Tactical's ceiling is much higher. So it would just kind of be going backwards, and I don't think that's a TL move. And the thing about TL is, I, oh, I was just no, go for it, finish. The thing about TL, I think people kind of overlook is that TL for we're kind of the team that was. The the t- they wanted to be like C9. If you remember back to 2016, they had the rookie trio of Matt, Lurlo, and Dardoff. You remember even before that, right? When they were cursed, they were the team that became Gravity yeah. because they raised it. Well, okay, they put Cop and Saint Vicious on a team with Bunny Fufu and some others, but <laughs> obviously, like they were the team that did C9 before C9 did C9 with FlyQuest, right? They were they were the team that got the Challenger team yeah. qualified in the LCS and then sold it to to Davis Vague and made gra- who made Gravity, right? Like. They they were the platonic idea of C nine before C nine was C nine. And then right. the break and then breaking point happened. And then the the Dardoch, Piglet, Phoenix, Loco Doco yeah. blew up happened. And then Teal's like, okay, uh, the, the, do, raising up kids is is too much trouble. Let's just buy some experienced players to win titles. It was very much of everything exploded over that roster, and there was like, okay, let's just buy. It, it's easier just to buy proven talent and then win from there. And that's kind of what happened, where they had the, the breaking point, and they tried to raise up Dardock, and Dardock was on this, you know, on the rise of being this great, you know, blabber-like talent. Where you could have seen, I mean, there was it was it would have been difficult to see Dardock become an MVP in 2016, 2017, but then everything just blew up, and now they are the team that pays for everything. And with the current global pandemic, and you know, I'm not saying TL doesn't have money, of course they have money, but they're not going to be spending a boatload of money, and they can't really. They can't import, you know, Chovy right now. They can't just be like, hey, Chovy, come here for $5 million. That's not going to happen. It's just, it's not, A, feasible, and two, it's not logical in terms of monies and, and financially. So they're going to have to go back to their roots and try to raise up some young talent, especially if, if Double F leaves. Tactical will have to be raised up correctly because he does have the talent, but you just have to have the right infrastructure. And if you don't have the right infrastructure, Tactical is going to just become another player that is trod out there for a season two, doesn't do as well, and then he's stuck in Academy for the rest of his career. You mentioned Dardock. Dardock is now the jungler at TSM. Known for a very large personality, to put it nicely, right? Uh, someone who has had issues in team environments before has found himself kicked out of teams very quickly uh, as a result. Double lift is somewhat comparable in that regard, right? So motivated to win, which is admirable. However, sometimes at the cost of his teammates. We heard this a lot about Ale, right? Oh, yeah. and, and the partnership between them and how like Ale, someone who's very sort of held back and introverted and, and you know has some self-esteem issues within his regard, being sort of broken down by someone who's so over the top and, and not necessarily that, in some clarification here, not necessarily that Ale or that Doublelift personally attacked Ale, but in the way that Doublelift raised his concern about their team environment problems and the way they played the game made it seem like it was Ale's fault. Even if it's not directly, you know, that criticism was not directly at Ale. Uh, you know, and so, and that was pretty well documented, I think, and a lot of people knew about that. In the event that we see these two people team out, Dardock and Doublelift, with these very large personalities that self destruct pretty easily. Do you think that that can work? I mean, my issue isn't with like the narratives around Double Lift and Dardock. My issue was is with the actual in-game analysis of Double Lift and Dardock. Because if you look at the way TSM has wanted to play, I'll split, and I wrote this in my uh, LCS preview as well. It'll come out tomorrow. It's that they really want to play around the top side of the map. They've been sending Dardock topside a lot. Um, their focus is on, you know, mid jungle and then jungle top. Um, they still do a lot of things that people would maybe consider archaic, like invading second blue. 
Um, they have a very like defined style and a lot of that defined style, I think, uh, revolves around one of the side lanes not being the focus. And so right now it is top side. If double lift returns that probably based on double lifts history with other teams. And I'm talking about like analytically, this is not a narrative thing. It becomes bot side right? Like, like when he was on TSM previously. So what happens to Broken Blade in that situation? And what happens to Dardox jungle pathing in that situation? And how did they deal with um, this new mid jungle going bot side instead of top? Uh, just because it really seemed like even when Sven was on the team, and I think Sven is someone who is incredibly good, um, he's had obviously a career resurgence on C9. But if you looked at what TSM was wanting him to do, a lot of the time they were just putting him weak side and having him play Ezreal. And it, it is so much so that it became a meme, right? So for me, the issue isn't are Dardock and Double Lift going to butt heads? Is this going to be a huge internal issue? It's like analytically, how is this team going to work? And I do not know. Yeah, if you're going to make this work, if you're going to get double lift on this team, like as 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 silly as it sounds, the best way to actually go around it, if you wanted to make the best team on paper, would to be trade Broken Blade for a Hauntzer and just go ru- really just run it back. Just trade, like, just we have Darda. We saw them play an Avalee's in house scrim yeah. tournament a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Hauntzer is. They're Hauntzer is still really us. good. Hauntzer is actually still really good, and I think Hauntzer would fit that role perfectly of being the weak side of the team, where I don't think Broken Blade fits the style of Broken Blade and Double If both needing resources and attention, and then Dardock having to pick between the two. It, it wouldn't work out. I don't think it could work out. Who knows? People can change their uh, play styles. Broken Blade might be able to play more of a weak side role if you know coached into it. But the the most logical, like the best team on paper they could probably get is if to trade Hauntzer for Broken Blade and be like, hey, uh, you know, get the two Turkish friends, like Broken Blade and Closer are really good friends. You know, if Hauntzer back with the old TSM members, he could play the weak side really well. I think Hauntzer is still a really good player. He just kind of has been overshadowed by having to play weak side a lot on a Golden Guardians team. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Broken Blade with Double Lift doesn't really work for me in the theorizing and theory crafting of how it would work. And weirdly enough, the, the probably the best roster they could make without breaking the bank would just to bring back Hauntzer and trade him for Broken Blade and just have Hauntzer, Dardock, Bjergsen, Bio, and Double Lift and kind of just have a uh, a reunion of 2016, 2017 TSM with Dardock, you know, role-playing as Svenskaren. Well, you do break the import rules and you're theorized there with uh, Golden Guardian says FBI also does count as an import, uh, sadly. Oh, see, oh, see, Keith ABC. Yes. Keith ADC. Yes. Well, <laughs> Keith ADC. For now, that is all from us. Uh, we will be talking some more League of Legends, uh, I believe, tomorrow. Tomorrow at mm-hmm. uh, April 17th uh, at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we will have the Riff Rewind, which is normally on Tuesdays. However, is tomorrow. Um, and we will be talking about the LCS playoffs and the LEC playoffs. We will have a second Riff Rewind show as a pre-show to the LCS on ESPN2. Uh, on Sunday at our Sunday, April 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And for all of our other League of Legends content from myself, from Emily, from Tyler, you can check out ESPN.com slash esports and YouTube.com slash ESPN esports. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. 